from the Gothic Quarter in Barcelona. This is Market Movers, the podcast that gives you a closer look at the financial markets to trade responsibly. Here are your hosts, Lior Cohen and Yohai Elam. Hello and welcome, and thank you for listening and clicking on the subscribe button. This is episode number 69, recorded on Monday, September 28th. I'm your co-host, Lior Cohen, and join me, he's still exhausted from last night's Catalonia elections, Yuhai Ilam. How's it going, Yuhai? Great, how's it doing, Lior? I'm also excited with the discovery of water on Mars. Oh, wow, wow. So there there were a few uh, developments in the markets, not only uh, not Signs only of life, here. signs of life, maybe. Yeah, yeah. well, that's uh, more than signs of life than Yellen's uh, speech uh, from last week, oh, that's yeah, I'll tell yeah, you that. Oh thing, yeah, she didn't, she didn't seem so concentrated, did she? Oh man, well maybe because of the, she was exhausted and there was no water. To, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was dehydrated, yeah. yeah exactly. Should have gone to Mars, yeah. Oh, well, uh, next time <laughs> around, man, they're planning an excursion there, so yeah, it's all, only take her 20 years. Yeah, yeah. All, all right. There. All right, this week uh, we have uh, the US market developments, Canada's economy, Catalonia's uh, elections, copper market, and a preview for the main events of the week. But but first, the US. So what's going on in the US? We're growing, we're not growing. Yellen is uh, hawkish, she's dovish. I'm a little bit of confused. Come on, I have to uh, straight the lines. Uh, what's going on over there? Well, things are looking better there. So let's start from the bad things. We had poor durable goods orders, especially core orders. They showed poor investment, but then everything became uh, much better. Yeah, well, uh, the US GDP, we saw that, uh, so what? It's expanded by 3.9% in Q2, better than uh, 37 from the previous estimate, so yeah. you can't uh, sneeze that off. No, well, you can't sneeze that off by saying that the first quarter was poor with very poor growth. Oh, well, here we go again. But if you look at the components, you find there's some good data, don't you? Yeah, yeah. We saw that uh, when it comes to uh, consumer goods, at least, we did see that uh, there was a little bit of a growth. And even though we, you know, when you look at it, we, we say, oh, uh, maybe there wasn't any major progress, but we have to take into account that there is the whole and mighty oil. Oil has gone down pretty severely in the past year or so. Now it's around a 40 and change. So it means that people have a little bit more coins in their uh, in their wallets. And then does it mean that they're consuming more? And uh, according to our least recent, uh, if you look at the real personal consumer expenditure, at least, we have seen that it has gone up in the past year. And now it's, uh, it has gone up roughly, I think, by 3.1% year over year, 3.2% year over year from uh, August. And when you look at the chart of uh, real uh, personal uh, consumption compared to oil prices, and we'll put it on the chart on the website, you see that uh, it has gone in different directions. Uh, oil prices has gone down, personal consumption has gone up. So is that uh, the case? So we're looking for more uh, consumption down the line? Well, that's good news. And I guess we're looking for more consumption down the line in relation to oil. But uh, it's a double-edged sword, as we've talked about that in the past because lower prices of oil mean less investment in the mining and oiling and oil sector. So that's what, why we've seen durable goods orders uh, result in a mediocre, mediocre figure. So I don't think it's all it's all rosy with oil. We've already spoken about that in the past, but it's good news. The GDP figure also showed good news regarding inventories and in general, and that gives the dollar another boost. Well, I will say that I also, when I looked at uh, the labor market, it. And uh, to be honest, I also expected that, well, yeah, because oil prices have gone down, we'll see a sharp uh, decline also in uh, jobs gains. And uh, so far, uh, let's put it this way, it's still around the 200k plus, right? Roughly. Last month, it wasn't so good, but still, all in all, you can say that the growth rate uh, has subsided substantially. We're still looking at pretty low uh, unemployment rates. Yeah, we should put an asterisk on it, but, yeah, but you know what I'm talking good, about. Yeah. And also, I will also say Say that the top states that produce oil, uh, Texas, North Dakota, so far North Dakota did present a 0.6 drop in employment in July, but both Texas and North Dakota, they still have very low unemployment rates of 4.2% and 3% respectively. So you cannot dismiss that. We're still looking at these uh, giant states and they're still, even though they are very concentrated when it comes to oil, that's where they get the bulk of their revenues. They're still looking uh, pretty good when it comes to the 
unemployment situation compared to the rest of the US. What do you have to say about that, sir? Well, well that's good news. Uh, that uh, gives us more reasons for a rate hike because if I understand correctly, the fall in the price of oil is, uh, let's say, 80% positive, 20% negative. So mostly positive, I guess, from more consumption all over the United States and also not too much damage to uh, employment around the oil sector. So Yeah, and uh, w when you look at the World Bank, according to their uh, estimates and yeah, World Bank, we should put an asterisk on every outlook, but I think it goes around saying to every uh, outlook, they project that the drop in oil prices will have an increase in global GDP of around 07 to 0.8% and will reduce inflation by 1% over the medium term. Medium term, probably in the next couple of years or so. Yeah. So there is some substantial impact on not only on the growth, but also on inflation. So we should see some uh, Americans having more coin in their in their wallets and will they spend it? Will they deleverage? That's maybe that's where economists uh, maybe deviate uh, from one another. Uh, wh wh where is your take? You think they're, they will actually start to deleverage or uh, take off uh, some uh, some of their debt or will start to spend more? I think they deleverage the American consumer deleveraged quite a bit since the big crash in 2008 mm -hmm. and things are improving in that sense. Most of the pain or a significant part of the pain is behind us. We're already seeing more spending in Q2. Now Q2 is already in the past. We're at the end of uh, Q3, but I think we'll see this uh, trend uh, going forward. So maybe we'll see more firings in the oil sector and that could maybe hurt employment more than it hurt employment so far, but the overall impact is, is positive mm -hmm. for the uh, greater US economy. Even though we should also note that uh, according to the last uh, Federal Reserve's uh, outlook, they did point out that they revised up their GDP for growth rate for this year, but they revised down for 2016 and 2017 a little bit, not uh, big, uh, 0.2 percentage points for 2016 and for 2017 it's going to be 2.2 percent growth in instead of 2.3 percent. Not big headline news, but still, it's something that we should consider as maybe this transitory effect will, it is a transitory, so it won't last long and uh, as such, uh, maybe we should also look uh, up ahead for not so uh, such uh, such big uh, numbers as we did in the Q2. Yeah, yeah. So in in Q3 and Q4, we're expecting well uh, a mean reversal back to around two to two point five percent. So along the lines with the growth rates we've seen on a yearly basis in in recent years, the very steady and frustrating growth, depending on how you want to look at it. But all right, but, um, I think uh, this steady growth is a good sign of. Hopefully we'll see no more bubbles, but of course we can't expect <laughs> bubbles always uh, happen and burst. But oh. in general, steadier growth means a lower chance of bubbles. So I think uh, having this mediocre growth, better ha it's better to have mediocre and steady growth than boom and bust cycles. Hmm, all right. And uh, speaking of boom and bust, Yellen and Dudley, so they gave uh, their speeches. Uh, what's the news? Is there something uh, Yellen suddenly start to flip-flop what she's... Uh... No, it's the nuances. So she did just reiterate uh, the case. She made the case for raising the rates to 2015. She talked about a strong US economy, probably stronger than her health. Well, we all hope her well, but uh, wish her well. But anyway, it's um, she did seem a bit more upbeat on employment, on inflation, on the necessity to raise rates in 2015. And also William Dudley, Bill Dudley, which has a permanent vote in the FOMC. He also uh, talked about raising the rates later this year. There are only two more meetings left. December is sort of the place we're circling in our calendars. And this is just different from the tone that we've heard from Dudley in August when he said the case for raising the rates is less compelling or something along that line. And also Yellen after the decision in September, after the Fed decision, where she sounded a bit uh, dovish, worrying about China, about uh, the dollar, about the economy. All right. Okay. So uh, we have that and we have uh, more reports uh, along this week and also more speeches, right? Uh, but we'll talk about at the end of the show about what's uh, up ahead. Uh, let's move to what's going on in Canada. Canada. So speaking of oil, it has done uh, pretty much a, a net uh, positive effect on the US. So, so it seems at least for now, but for Canada, hmm, not so much, right? We have the GDP uh, this week will uh, come out, but what's going on uh, over there? It's still, uh, they have a little bit of a problem, so to speak, right? Yeah. So if you say that the US didn't really feel the bust in oil and oil prices, because it's only concentrated in a few states and these states are not suffering yet. Well, tell that to oil producing countries and 
there are worse cases than Canada, for example, Venezuela. Mm. And uh, but in Canada, Canada is in recession, a very shallow recession. In uh, Q1 and Q2, the economy contracted. Now this week we'll get the figure for July. Canada releases GDP on a monthly basis. They're very special in that sense. Yeah, that's uh, one of the few, no, that they actually release on the month. The only one basis. I know, yeah, yeah. The country, no. Huh. And perhaps more importantly than uh, the figure for Q3, for sorry, for July, we'll have maybe a confirmation of the recession in Q1 and Q2, and um, that could give another push down to the Canadian dollar that reached an 11-year low against the US dollar last week. Yeah, yeah, it has gone down. It was around 1.1, I think, or by the end of 2014, right? And it has gone up uh, well over 1.3, so... Yeah, uh, it reached, it, it crossed 134, breaking the previous cycle high of 2015, breaking the post-crisis low of 2000, sorry, the post-crisis high for dollar cad in 2009, and and reaching levels last seen in 2004. Wow, and all this, in the meantime, we have Bank of Canada is uh, reduced rates a couple of times already, right? This year, exactly. it's a 0.5 percent now. Are we looking for additional rate cuts uh, along the line this year, maybe? It depends a lot on the Fed. If the Fed raises rates and pushes the US dollar higher and the Canadian dollar lower, and uh, then maybe the Bank of Canada can just sit on its hands. Uh, this is relevant also for other central banks, but I think we won't see any action in the upcoming meeting but uh, we might see further cuts along the road. Uh, after the crisis, the Bank of Canada eventually cut rates up to 0 0.25. So yeah, so we may, we'll maybe see another easy. cut. Yeah. yeah, it's not the big deal. Also, their CPI, their inflation, it's not the high. It's around the core CPI is 2.1%. So it's not like they have much of an inflation situation. So they can no. reduce rates. It's not a problem. And the only problem maybe they do have is from the government. No, I mean, they are still adamant at uh, reducing a deficit so it still seems maybe they should step up their game and start to expand actually their deficit a little bit uh, deficit spending so to speak at least for the short term because the private sector isn't doing so well and the oil and gas which accounts for what 27 percent of the gdp so this re this area is continues to contract so they have to step up and see where where they have to get some more uh, growth yeah no? the debt to gdp ratio in canada is extremely extremely low, so they have room for deficit spending. That's another, but you talked about government, about politics, we have elections in Canada mm. in October. Uh, that means that at the moment there's no action taken by the government because everybody's busy with the elections. Oh, okay. And we'll see which government uh, is elected, and then uh, maybe we'll see some uh, deficit spending. Oh, all right. We'll... So maybe so we should uh, pigeonhole this uh, yeah. discussion until October, until yeah, after yeah, the until elections. Just a few weeks away, so uh, I think we'll have a clearer picture after the elections. All right. And speaking of elections, then oh, you give me a lot of segues today, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Catalonia. So uh, do you do want to? separate huh it's uh, it's uh, scotland all over again or what if it were scotland ov all over again it would have ended like scotland with the small majority against independence and this whole topic would be uh, gone erased but i think both sides here want to keep the topic alive it's easier to blame the other side for problems than uh, deal with your own corruption in any case it's not exactly as you said okay the pro-independence parties did gain a majority in parliament but there are a few caveats here first the mainstream party didn't gain a majority on its own the right, left-wing, center party, the sort of mainstream coalition, they fell short of a majority, and to reach a majority, they have to team up with the extreme anti-capitalistic radical left party called Coop, and that wow. would be hard. That's always hard, yeah, you so, don't have to hang with the Coop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the second thing is they build it as a referendum on independence, and if it's a referendum, you have to have not only an absolute majority in parliament, but you also want to have a majority of votes, and they fell short, it reached only 48%. Oh, so, so that's not good. You can see that as a victory if you look at seats in Parliament, but the opposition here in Catalonia and also in Madrid sees it as a failure. In any case, it's everything is in the air because we have elections in Spain. Yeah, it's uh, in November. There still isn't a final date, but it'll be either uh, late November or early December, and we might see a change of government. The current Prime Minister Rajoy could end his job. The government was not so successful, uh, but we'll see what happens uh, next. If we have Podemos, the sort of series of Spain forming government, they support a referendum for Catalonia. 
Mm, obviously. So, but is it actually realistic? I mean, with all this ta- hype and talk, is it actually realistic that there will there is a chance of their descending from the from Spain? Actually, well, as far as I've been living here for four and a half years, most Catalans just want better conditions to manage their own finances and to have more respect for their culture and language. There isn't a clear majority for independence, but in the past years, the past yeah past few years, they've been pushed to the corner with their back against the wall from the central government and to many people that didn't support independence and see that as the only option, even though they know that in the short term or even medium term, they're going to suffer economically quite hard. Mm, yeah, it's just uh, a little bit of a problem. And also, the Catalonia region is actually doing it quite well compared to the rest of Spain, right? So that's another thing that they may be concerned that they are carrying the load, so to speak, a little bit more than the rest of Spain. Yeah, there's a huge fiscal deficit here, uh, bigger than uh, Bavaria in comparison with the whole of Germany, bigger than the region of London, Southeast England in, in comparison into the UK. So that's, of course, uh, an area of uh, contention. And of course, it's a different language, different culture, not so different, but uh, many Catalans uh, feel a lack of respect from the central government. And You don't give me respect. Exactly. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. So there are many issues here uh, for our bigger topics, the markets, the euro. If Catalonia leaves, unilaterally declares independence. In theory, it is kicked out of the European Union, of the Eurozone. Uh, it doesn't have the Euro anymore. It could have a much bigger impact than Greece leaving the Eurozone because Catalonia is rich. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, hefty region, right? Yeah, so to speak. and um, a secession, a separation of a region also has bigger implications than a departure of one country out of the Eurozone because you have Flanders in Belgium, uh, South Tyrol in Italy, other regions in Spain, like the Basque country, they will all want to seek independence. And that's why in recent weeks, the, some leaders in the European Union woke up and said, hey, hey, don't... Uh, Stay, stay a part of Spain. Uh, yeah, you know, just stay down. here. Yeah, it's not as if so. Yeah, so it's a little bit different than what we just saw when it comes to uh, Scotland and the UK, right? Yeah, it's a whole different story. Yeah, and if they would have allowed them just to, uh, you know what, just go with the referendum, and uh, Spain uh, would have uh, maybe this uh, put the, they would have uh, put to rest this whole issue of uh, separation. Yeah, but they managed it very poorly, <clears throat> and I think that's one of the reasons that uh, the current government is going to go home they just hmm. fail you to think that the, t- the issue and you think that under Podemos, maybe they will be able to get a referendum? Yeah, and even if there is no Podemos government, and currently it seems unlikely that Podemos will uh, form the next government, but they might be in coalition. And even if just the socialists win an absolute majority, or, or with the coalition with Podemos, at least in the tone towards Catalonia may change. Perhaps not the politics, but the tone, the respect, it may change and, and sort of uh, push down the desire for independence, because many Catalans do want to feel also special Spanish and feel they can resolve the fiscal problems as well. Hmm. All right. So we'll have to keep notice of what's going on over there. And uh, finally, let's move on to uh, what's going on in copper. I mean, this market hasn't been doing so well, so to speak. And I think we can sum up this entire uh, segment by saying just one word, China. Oh, China. Yeah. China. Exactly. China. It's China. always boiled down to China. I have to blame someone on it. The, over there, obviously, China is uh, the leading uh, exporter of uh, the leading of a uh, importer exporter of a uh, copper, and it holds the highest uh, copper reserves also. So if China isn't doing so well, the copper market is also uh, not collapsing. And we have seen a sharp uh, decline in the uh, prices. And uh, so far, it seems that producers are still, for now, they're still expanding their output so that's another concern because if the demand is uh, coming down then what's with the producers uh, not adjusting so so far when you look at it according to the is icasg they uh, expect that uh, in 2000 and this year there will be an increase in production of around of mine production of around 4.4 percent and next year of 5.1 percent so that sounds bullish yeah yeah so it's still uh, i mean if you look at the Chile, for instance, it's the leader uh, of the uh, copper exporters. And when what you look at it, when I said China, I was confused. I, I didn't say that it's exporter; it's a major importer, of course. Uh, Chile is the main uh, exporter of uh, the world, and according to them, the the state-owned uh, Sodelso, if I'm butchering it, I'm sorry, the world's uh, biggest copper producer, increased its output by 5.5 percent in the first half of this year and plans to ramp up production by two million tons by 20. 
26 so a 20 percent gain from where they are now in 2014 so mm. from last year so they're still on course to uh, ramp up production and even uh, another uh, major producer freemore uh, freeport uh, mcmormon uh, also uh, one of the second largest i think producer in the world uh, also uh, plans to increase its output by eight percent this year so, so the falling price of copper doesn't deter uh, doesn't stop production growth well you know how it is it's like a moving a ball people you know you cannot stop the ball from moving forward but you can't uh, stop it uh, from uh, uh, throwing it further and pushing it further down the line mm -hmm. and what i mean is when it comes to capital expenditure companies have been cutting down oh. also free freeport M mcmormon uh, bhp uh, billton also a major uh, producer uh, plans to s actually to slash its output by 12 percent in 2016 and also both of these companies have reduced substantially their their capex so down the line we will see mm. a decline in production may for bhp it will be next year for freemort uh, for freeport it will be probably in the next several years down the line so we are seeing some changes but china's uh, at least uh, china uh, it seems that they have gone a little bit down when it comes to their consumption up until may at least for this year uh, consumption has gone down by around three percent but on the other hand in may demand has gone up has gone up a little bit and was the highest level of consumption since December. Mm. So there it's is never a one way street. It's never. That's why you cannot look at the, the market and see, oh, China's not doing so well. So maybe the copper uh, consumption is uh, declining necessarily. So it's a little bit uh, more tricky than that. But for now, the outlook still looks grim when it comes to copper prices. It's still the IMF still projects that will remain low this year and next year. So we aren't looking at any at uh, any time uh, soon any recovery especially when this ball is all already been running and mine producers continue uh, continue to produce at uh, these high levels and even some of them uh, expect to ramp up production in the coming year so it is a little bit tricky and, and for now the, it doesn't seem so the only way it could reverse is if china will actually start to do a little bit better and will start to increase its uh, demand again and for now i don't know it doesn't oh, seem so optimistic right we heard talk about stimulus but i I think it, it'll be maybe a small correction in the in copper demand or yeah. it, won't, it won't be a big turnaround. This maybe if China will start actually, you know, supporting exports by cutting down again, uh, it's trying to depreciate its currency again. Maybe that will uh, help it uh, export again, no? Yeah, yeah. They're making lots of reforms and it's still early days to see what the results are. All right. Well, we have to keep a close call on that and see and re revisit this issue, see what's going on. All right. For this week, let's look at the main events of the week and we won't start from the from the end because that's the main no. course let's start from what's uh, chronicle uh, order uh, on tuesday we have consumer confidence right so that's gonna come out tomorrow yeah we're expecting a fallen consumer confidence in the co conference board consumer confidence to just go in line with the fall in the university of michigan's consumer confidence so a score of 96 points is expected so the expectations are low which leaves more room for an upside surprise all right and wednesday we have the uh, canada's uh, gdp right so that's yeah. going to come out we talked about that quite a lot uh, month over month we're expecting a growth rate of 0.2 percent but as aforementioned we have to look also at up, uh, revised levels for q1 and q2 to see there uh, how deep the recession is currently right. it looks shallow but there is a recession all right and manufacturing pmi we have uh, from the us right that's on thursday yeah let's go back to wednesday we have adp nfp oh okay it's, uh, oh yeah yeah it's basically we're expecting expecting more of the same around 190,000 job gains. It's worth to remember that there is a weak correlation or not so clear correlation between ADP and private jobs gained in the NFP on Friday, but has an immediate impact on markets. Oh, always. it does move the US dollar? Of course. Oh, okay. So we should see if it's going to be a little bit higher than that, then we should be uh, a US dollar positive. Yeah. And the other way around, of course. Oh, okay. So that's like a preview for the NFP basically. Yeah, always is. Even though the correlation is yeah it's a pretty much yeah pretty much uh, sometimes it's way off from what they show us to what is actually yeah can going be a on difference of 60,000 which is hugely it's very substantial it yeah is. so yeah should, we should put also uh, put a dot on it right it's yeah. not uh, all right so we have that and uh, something else another hint as you mentioned the ISM manufacturing PMI even though services is the bigger sector in the United States uh, well unless uh, Donald Trump will start to bring back 
tech manufacturing from China. Yeah, you because, never know. Yeah, because he's competent or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So we're expecting manufacturing is almost at a standstill according to ISM. We had 51.1. Now we're expecting basically more of the same 50.8. Uh, we don't have the services figure until next week, until after the NFP. So this time the manufacturing PMI will carry more weight. All right, come on. Enough with this whole uh, talk about the. Uh, let's go to the main dish, the NFP. That's the main course. Okay, so the we expect a higher job gains, 200,000, up from 173,000. But what's important is what we say. What's your guess? All right, I'm uh, I'm still uh, pretty uh, not so optimistic, so I'm going to go with 180. Mm, well, I'll always take the optimistic side. I'll go with uh, 220, just uh, above. And I'll say that we're going to have a nice revision for August. So last month is going to be even rosier. Mm, well, it's going to oh, be okay. rosy and not disappointing. Yeah, not as disappointing as was last Last time. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so if you say that it's going to be 220, if it's going to be above 200, you think that'll be enough for the Fed to actually start moving into that direction that you so want them to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, of course. Uh, it's still too far from the December meeting. So in order to see expectations really, really change, I will have to see either a crash of 100,000 this time or a huge surprise of 300,000. But I think anywhere around 200,000 is going to keep the Fed on track for December 8 hike. And of course, the next NFP is in November and December. Uh, so we have two have more. more right? yeah. yeah, so we have two more for the Fed. Also, they'll have two more before they actually start moving that needle, if and when. Yeah, and of course, wages, as always, they're expected to rise 0.2 month over month. And I hope they will break the annual range. It was a range of between 1.9 and 2.3. So hopefully it'll be higher this time, 2.4 maybe. Mm, but if it's going to remain at 2.0, point two then that's again it's not it much change expectations yeah it's not much to push the fed towards that lift off no we're a bit too far from the next important decision so we need huge surprises either up or down to change market perceptions all right okay that's it that's our show thank you as usual Chai. thank you Lior. all right thank you all for listening if you like our show give us a five star rating us on itunes and you can subscribe to the show via stitcher email rss or itunes whatever suits you fancy so i'll next week this is Lior saying for a class saying a great week and rest responsibly this podcast should be used for educational, research, and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. There are no guarantees expressed or implied of future positive returns in regard to the subject matter contained herein. Understand the risks inherent in investing before making the decision to invest or consult an investment professional for more information. A reasonable due diligence has been performed in regards to the information in this podcast. However, the hosts and guests of this podcast expressly disclaim any liability for accidental emissions of information or errors in fact. For comments, suggestions, and questions, visit the podcast page at forexcrunch.com or tradingnrg.com, where you can also find past episodes and subscribe to the show. Our listeners make market movers possible. <laughs>